Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Ian, and um, well done to all of you for making it here so early. It was a struggle for me, so for you it must have been even more difficult. Uh, what I want to do is talk a little bit about this new project that I'm working on with Simon Davies. Um, many of you will already know Simon um, of the LSE. Uh, he's the founder of Privacy International and also the Big Brother Awards, which have rolled out across the world, and has been involved in uh, the field of privacy for about 30 years now. I have to say myself, I've been working on these sort of areas for about 20 years, so both of us are showing our age. Um, one of the things that, as we sort of float around speaking at conferences around the world, um, looking at all these different interconnected issues and problems, is one, it's a very good opportunity to meet some fantastic people who are dedicated to trying to stop the, the encroaching surveillance state that's being rolled out globally. However, it also makes us painfully aware of the lack of communication sometimes, the lack of coordination, or the lack of actually knowing what would be the most effective thing to do uh, amongst all these diverse groups. Um, so what we wanted to do was set up an organisation to help facilitate that, which is the new baby organisation called Code Red. But what I want to do first is just lay out some of the problems as we see it before going on to the solutions. Normally when we do this presentation together, I get the first half and he gets the fun bit at the end. So at least I get that today. But the first half is what I call my Cassandra talk, someone who is fated to see the future but nobody ever believes her. And as a whistleblower, that's sometimes how I felt over the last 20 years or so. I have to say, I think we're now living in the era of the whistleblower. Back in the 1990s, when I was involved in it, it was a very different feel to the whole issue. Now it's much more widely accepted. And I think that's a real shame in a way, not from the point of view of support for the whistleblowers, which is great, but from the fact that so many are now coming forward is a stunning indictment of how our systems, which are supposed to hold the governments and corporations to account, to oversee them, and to apply justice when required, how all these systems have egregiously failed over the last 10 to 15 years. And this is why we're seeing more and more whistleblowers coming out, not just the highly notorious global whistleblowers like Edward Snowden, but particularly in the UK and across Europe and America. Many whistleblowers coming out from the health sector, from finance, uh, from business, and they might not get the same degree of notoriety, the same degree of protection and coverage, but they face just as much, just as many problems in their, in their own lives when they have that bravery to step forward and say, no, this is enough. Most whistleblowers will see their reputations ruined, they will be traduced, they will probably lose their jobs and thereby their professional status and their means of supporting themselves, which of course has many other knock-on effects, such as not being able to pay the mortgage, stress on your family, relationship breakdown. And this happens time and time again. Now, why on earth should this happen to people of courage, people of integrity? It should be the people who are breaking the laws that they're reported on who are held to account. Now, if you're an intelligence whistleblower or coming out of central government or the military, you face all that, but also more which is automatic criminalisation in the eyes of the law. Under the Official Secrets Act in the UK, if you come out of any of these sectors, you will face up to two years in prison per charge. And that's bad enough. However, of course, now what we're seeing in America with the uh, Obama's war on whistleblowers is whistleblower after whistleblower, whether they go through the approved channels or not, being threatened with up to 35 years in prison for telling the truth and exposing the crimes of the spies. So something's going badly wrong. And as I said, I have a nodding acquaintance with this process. Um, as Ian mentioned, I used to work for MI5 in the 1990s and resigned to help my partner, former partner, David Shaler, go public about a whole range of spy crimes, including files held on government ministers, innocent people being put in prison, illegal phone taps, no change there, you might think, um, bombs that could and should have been prevented on UK streets, which the spies did not prevent, and then they lied to government to cover up their mistakes. And finally, it culminated in a case that became known as the Gaddafi assassination plot. In 1996, MI6 funded an Al-Qaeda affiliate group in Libya to try and assassinate Gaddafi illegally. And of course, the attack went wrong because Gaddafi survived to be assassinated by the same groups in 2011, but it killed innocent people. Now, we couldn't think of anything more heinous than that. This is precisely not what we had signed up to the intelligence community to get involved in, state-sponsored terrorism, which is why we took the decision to resign, to go public, and thereby end up going on the run, literally around Europe, as Ian mentioned, 
and we had to live in hiding for a year, live in exile for another three years, and watch as our friends and family, our supporters and journalists even, were arrested around us. I too was arrested and David Shaler went to prison twice. First of all, when the British failed to extradite him from France to stand trial under the Official Secrets Act. And then when he returned voluntarily in 2000 to face trial, to face the music, and he faced a kangaroo court and was inevitably convicted and inevitably returned to prison. So it's a very high price to pay. However, I don't want to dwell too much on that aspect. What I would like to do is draw some lessons from that that I learned during those years and subsequently in my campaigning years once the case was over. Now, the first lesson, I think, was quite how controlled the media can be by the spies in the UK and across other countries too. We have a situation where um, there are a battery of laws to protect the spies. In the UK, our spies are the least accountable and most legally protected of any intelligence community in the Western world. They can plant fake stories in the media, which I think is what we saw recently with the big Sunday Times story, accusing Snowden of um, giving the information to the Russians and the Chinese, and all these secret agents had to suddenly be moved because their lives are under threat. That stank of information operations. We also see as well with the media that um, the journalists as well in this country can too be prosecuted for exposing these sort of crimes. Under the Official Secrets Act, journalists will also face two years in prison if it can be proved they caused damage by writing their stories. So that's a slightly alarming because, of course, we expect the media to be the, the fourth estate, to hold the spies to account, to hold, speak truth to power. But it's very easy for them to be controlled. One of the other lessons I just briefly want to touch on as well from my whistleblowing years is what it is like to live without real privacy. Now, privacy is a very nebulous word. It's a fundamental right, a very basic fundamental right enshrined under the UN Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 for some very good reasons. But from a personal point of view, I can tell you what it's like because when we were on the run, when we were living in hiding, we were fresh out of MI5. We knew exactly their capabilities. We knew exactly how they would come after us and try and investigate us. So we knew that we could not have private electronic communications, even with our family. We knew that our telephones would be bugged. We knew that our emails would be read. We knew that our properties would be bugged too, including even our bedroom. Think about it. I have to say the only psychological defense we had was that we were probably having more fun than the little gray men in suits who were listening to us. We also had to face the awful truth that some of our friends were pressured by the special branch police to report back on us. So that lack of privacy, <clears throat> in every environment in your life, even with your friends, is very corrosive to the human spirit. It's very easy to slip into paranoia and you begin all the time to self-censor. And I can attest to this, my, my family used, to this day gets frustrated if we're talking on the telephone and something comes up and I say, shh, shh, don't mention that. And they're sort of used to this now, but that's how the paranoia can strike. But on a wider societal level, privacy is so vital too. Because if we all feel that we are being watched like that, and now we know from Snowden that we all are potentially being watched like that, then that is when we all begin to self-censor. And when we're on the internet, which permeates every aspect of our lives, then if we're self-censoring not only what we say, but also what we read, what we download to watch, what we write on our Facebook pages, how we conduct our relationships, even how we organize politically, then that is the slide towards totalitarianism. Because if you are self-censoring as a society, you cannot effectively push back against states that are taking away your basic fundamental rights. You cannot organize effectively. And this is precisely why, in the immediate aftermath of the Nazi era, privacy was enshrined as a basic right. Because it is the last method, if we are private, it is the last line of defense against our governments. It gives us the capability to push back and this lesson, of course, was learnt very well in East Germany, living under the Stasi as well. So these are all very fundamental rights. And at the moment, we're looking at the internet being under sustained attack in terms of our privacy, not just from the surveillance techniques that Snowden exposed to us. And every story that comes out provides just yet one more horror, one more horror. 
up to and including, do you remember the um, optic nerve programme? This was lampooned by John Oliver when he interviewed Snowden as the dick pic programme. I don't know how many of you saw that. And he got the message across very effectively by saying that. But think about it. Many of us have long-distance relationships, or we travel for work. We want to stay in contact with our loved ones. And we do that, perhaps, using video chat. Now, apparently, and I didn't know this, apparently 10% of those chats tend to be quite pornographic in nature. Well, nothing wrong with that. You know, we're all allowed our jollies with our loved ones. 10%, though, and all of these are being watched by GCHQ and the other spies. Now, people say, I'm doing nothing wrong, I have nothing to hide. You're doing nothing wrong by having a conversation like that with your loved one. But I'm pretty damn sure you'd like to keep that private. So these are the sort of issues that we're facing. The internet also is under sustained attack too from the corporates, the corporations. I don't know how many of you have been following what is known as the copyright wars that started with, let's go after a few pirates who might want to download a bit of music. But now we are seeing these mega entertainment corporations, mainly in America, using um, state infrastructure to try and kill off file sharing sites. The most notorious was mentioned in a talk yesterday where um, Kim.com in New Zealand had his file sharing site, Mega Upload, illegally taken down by the FBI with no due process and his home raided in an illegal FBI um, raid with a SWAT team in New Zealand. And that isn't even enough. The corporations now put pressure on the American government to tighten up the law so that they can use things like deep packet inspection to check the individual bits that are going through that might contain pirated information or pirated com copyrighted information over the internet. So once you have that, you have the corporations acting as a stalking horse, effectively, for the spies. So not only can they see right into the very depths of what you're trying to send, in case you might be sending something you're not allowed to watch or not allowed to read, they can then pick up all your communications as well under the surveillance laws. It's a sort of ghastly pincer m movement on the part of the spies and the corporations. And I think this is a very interesting development because I would go along with Benito Mussolini's definition of fascism. Remember the Italian dictator in World War II? And his definition was the merger of the corporate and the state. And I think that's precisely what we're seeing now. So as activists, many of us say, we're living under a fascist regime and it's totalitarian. You follow Benito, Benito Mussolini's definition and we are there, effectively. We just don't have the brown shirts knocking on our door in the morning to take us away. So it's really a crisis of privacy, I think now, a crisis of our very civilization because our very way of life is underpinned entirely by the internet. And if we cannot trust that, if we cannot feel safe in that, then our very privacy and therefore our very way of life and our democracy is thereby threatened. So what can we do about this? That's all the sort of doom and gloom. Simon has been involved in this work for 30 years. I've been involved for 20. And as I said, we both of us have been privileged to work with amazing groups and amazing people right around the world from all sorts of different key communities that are needed to fight back against this monstrous developing panopticon. Those include, of course, the media to hold power to account, to get information from their whistleblowers and from their sources securely, to protect their sources. It includes the law as well. We need the law to be upheld and applied equally to everybody, including the corporations, including corrupt politicians, including those who take us to illegal wars or um, authorise assassinations using drones across the planet. And yes, it's these big boys that never get prosecuted. So we've got the media, we've got the law, we have civil society, and there's been a resurgence of single issue campaigning, things like Occupy or anti-austerity or student fees. And this is fantastic. But often the ways of campaigning, as each generation comes through, they end up reinventing the wheel and they end up making the same mistakes. And also the stakes are much higher now because it's much easier for, for example, the spies or the police to monitor all they have to do with most activist groups is go on Facebook and they'll see what's being organised or meet up, they'll see what's being organised. And we are giving away our strategy, our information for free to the spies. We're offering it up. It's like we've been groomed by this concept of Big Brother. You know, it's a good thing to not have any privacy. <clears throat> so we have those. We have the tech community as well. 
And this is something I've been involved in for the last uh, eight years now. And it's been a revelation seeing the capabilities, the awareness politically of some of these issues and the tools that are being developed to help the fight back, the push back. Some people might say it's too little too late. But I still think that when faced with this sort of lumbering monolith that tends to be the corporatists' interests, they can be quite slow moving, quite slow to react, and we can be nimble and quick and outpace them and outfox them, as indeed we've seen WikiLeaks do for many years now. We also need to involve the policy makers, the politicians. So there are all these different groups that are all doing good things in their own way, in their own sort of knowledge silos. Sometimes, though, it's very difficult even to get them talking to each other effectively, let alone talking across these different um, groups, these different specialities. So a lawyer will draft something and say, this is what we need to do to improve uh, oversight of the spies or whatever it is. We need this new law to protect people for this reason. And it's written in a very dense legalese. So who can understand it except another lawyer? Who would even know that that proposal is there, apart from specialists who specifically want to search out that information? It's not readily available for anybody to just access and learn from. So we see that there is a need, definitely, to try and broaden out this communication, open up these communication conduits between these different stakeholder groups. As I said, often we have this sort of silo um, infrastructure and what we are proposing in Code Red is to flip it, to make it horizontal, so that all these different disciplines can cross-pollinate, not just within the UK, but globally. There are initiatives going on in other European countries that are relevant to the fight against spy oversight, uh, about spy oversight in the UK. But because of the language problem, because of the specialism problem, most of us don't even know that that is going on. So what we're trying to do is create a clearinghouse, a repository, for this sort of information to become freely available um, for people to learn from dis different disciplines how best to push back against this particular problem or that particular problem or this one that might be looming. What works? What doesn't? Why do we need to recreate these wheels all the time? So we need to get this information being shared. We need also, once the information is there, to develop strategically more innovative attacks. I think a lot of NGOs particularly that I've worked with, because they're slightly worried about funding or the public perception or being on message or whatever, can become quite timid in the way they go after um, their, their targets. They are risk averse. So we need to stir this up a bit, make them feel part of a bigger community so that then they feel perhaps a little bit braver, a little bit stronger. We need to be more strategic, we need to be less cautious, we need to be more aggressive. And also, we need to have some fun doing this. So, for example, there's one project that Code Red has already unrolled across Europe. Um, in seven major cities, we've held workshops on something we call the Integrity Project. And this is designed to try and unpick how politicians sell surveillance laws. So, for example, post Snowden, everyone says, oh, he's had this huge effect. You know, we're all much more aware of what's going on. But if you actually look at the laws that have been passed in those countries that have taken notice of him, which are damn few compared to the whole world, if you look at the laws, they are all pretty much regressive because of these lone wolf attacks in you know, France or Denmark or Australia or Canada. That is always used as a justification to ram through yet more draconian snooping laws. So this is um, a developing problem. And what we find by doing this project across just European countries so far is the sense that the same arguments are used, even the same phraseology between languages is used. And if we can pick this apart and create a toolkit for journalists or activists or advocates to say, oh, they've said this, right, this is the response and question we need to ask, and really hold these people to account and do it in fun ways, then I think that would be um, a very useful tool People say, well, I don't really believe what I read in the media, perhaps, but they don't know why or what specifically is the lie and how to challenge that. <clears throat> so that's one particular project we've already got up and running. Um, the final thing as well, we do need to protect the whistleblower community better, both as journalists, protecting our sources, and I, it's great that conferences like this, and across Europe, by the way, I've seen, are bringing together the media 
um, community and the tech community because the tech is a very important way of at least giving your source a fighting chance not to be caught before the story breaks and to have a degree of protection after the story is broken. Um, we also, of course, as, you know, as journalists, need to be aware of the real world surveillance that is still possible and not become too complacent because we know that we've got our PGP and our Tor and our tails up and running. We also need to protect them legally better. The laws need reform. And this is where, again, communication between different stakeholder groups is vital. Because lawyers are there to apply the law, they can learn new cases, uh, win new case law. But all too often, they say they won't listen to the exact problems of the whistleblower. They won't listen to actually what's going on on the inside. That means that even if great laws are in place, they can still be subverted by the, the spies, ignored by the spies, and the spies get away with murder, literally. So what we're proposing to do is go after these, uh, I suppose, the, the key groups, not only the spies, but also slightly lower level, the general law enforcement. Everyone gets fixated on the spies because they're glamorous, so-called. But actually, there's a lot of problems coming out of law enforcement too. It's like trickle-down corruption, trickle-down surveillance. We also need to bring accountability to the international governmental organisations, groups like Interpol, Europol. How do we know what they're doing? There's no real oversight mechanism whatsoever with these groups. And also bring more oversight to the corporations, which, until they were Snowden, were complicit, were colluding quite merrily with the spy agencies around the planet. So, we want to build bridges. We want to build this clearinghouse. We want to create, through this clearinghouse, a strategic resource of information that all these different groups can use. And then also, as a think tank, provide tactical responses to specific problems based on the evidence. And that is key for us too. We know many things anecdotally, but we need to get the methodology and the evidence grounded as well. So that's the aim of Code Red. That is what we're aspiring to. Um, it's quite uh, new at the moment, as you've probably gathered. We're just unrolling our first projects. But we do want to bring in all these different key community groups. And it's great at conferences like this, more and more of these groups are being brought together. Although I think lawyers tend to run shy of most of these sort of events, and they are key too to what we are doing. We need to find ways of communicating effectively with policymakers, and with politicians. Not in geek language, not in lawyer speak, not in you know, angry campaigning. We need to make this effective, and by bringing everyone together and cross-pollinating ideas, we can become much more effective, much more aggressive, and we won't have a fighting chance against what is at the moment looking a bit like a global juggernaut of surveillance and totalitarianism looming in our direction. So please have a look at our website. Um, it's codered.is. Many of you will know that's for Iceland, which seems to be one of the saner places to put your website. It can't be taken down arbitrarily by the US as they claim global legal hegemony over their domain names. Um, follow us on Twitter. And anyone who's interested in helping, please do make contact with us through the website. And other than that, watch this space. We're going to have some fun. We're going to create some mischief. And hopefully, we will be effective in pushing back against the global spy panopticon. Thank you very much.